very pleased to welcome you all uh, to this inaugural event of the Meghalaya State Capability Forum. This uh, forum is for a discussion about the most important challenges and opportunities facing the state. As a state, we aspire to a vibrant and resilient economy to promote health and well-being of every person, to generate sustainable livelihoods that protect our environment while also increasing the welfare of our people, to build an education system that prepares our students for full and productive lives. These aspirations are important and urgent. As the state leadership, it is imperative that we deliver on these needs in a timely way. The challenges we may face may seem daunting, but we can cause for hope. Each challenge we solve builds our capability to solve more challenges. We have been using this principle of building our capability to address maternal and child mortality, nutrition, by mobilizing people across the multiple departments and at all levels, as well as the community leadership to develop tailored solutions, enabling people to access care. We have also mobilized the state and local community leadership to increase access and utilization of employment guarantee program and community development. These initiatives have yielded important quick wins and they are building our state capability to identify and solve problems, adapt solutions, mobilize stakeholders and collaborate uh, across different groups. This increases our capability to tackle the next challenge and the next challenge. We should think of building state capability as people of Meghalaya have thought of building the root bridges, just the way we are building something that will endure and grow stronger over time so that it can carry more and more weight. In this way, solving challenges makes our state more capable. It meets urgent needs and it builds public confidence in the state. This public confidence as well as all seen is essential for enabling the state to succeed in everything from combating COVID to climate change. So we recognize that solutions for these complex challenges are not easy. They require the courage to experiment. They require dedication to learn from both successes and failures. And they require leadership that provides a holding environment. So we are you know, really especially grateful for the leadership of our Honorable Chief Minister, P. Konrad Shangma, in supporting new initiatives and you know, address complex challenges in the state. He has provided great exemplary leadership by focusing on issues of critical importance and has created an environment which I call holding environment in which new ideas and innovations can be launched. Alongside the Chief Minister, I would like to appreciate the leadership of the Honorable Cabinet Ministers and uh, the Chief Secretary, you know, who are uh, very important in this process of building the state capability. So finally, I also would like to thank the CPR, Center for Policy Research in uh, Delhi, who are partnering with the government of Meghalaya to host this uh, state capability forum. So CPR is a leading think tank of India, conducting research and contributing to generating new ideas and hosting robust public debate about the structures and processes that shape contemporary life in India today. I would like to invite uh, Yamini Ayer, uh, the president of CPR, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically to uh, say a few words about uh, the forum. So Yamini, over to you. Honorable Chief Minister, Shri Sampak Kumarji, Ilant, uh, Mekla, uh, friends, uh, on behalf of the Center for Policy Research, it's an absolute privilege for me uh, to be part of this discussion and for the center to be a partner with the State Capability in, uh, Initiative uh, at Meghalaya. This is perhaps one of the first states that have actively taken taken on the mantle of addressing this extremely critical but foundational 
foundational issue that confronts India today. We face significant 21st century challenges. Each of these challenges requires the Indian state to be more agile, more adaptive, more innovative. And in order to be able to be agile, adaptive and innovative, we need to have a serious discourse about what will it take to strengthen the foundations of the state so that it can fulfill the aspirations of people. It's a real privilege and pleasure for us to be part of this thinking and uh, uh, dialogue with the state. And I hope that we can make a robust contribution. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. CPR has been part of uh, a large number of activities in Meghalaya, including working on health and with the public finance management work. Uh, sir, you may recall, uh, you'd also graced us uh, in early March for a discussion on fiscal federalism. We've really valued our engagement with the state. It's been an important learning ground for us and an important opportunity for us uh, to both strengthen our own understandings uh, as well as hopefully contribute uh, to the big challenges of building the Indian state's capability uh, for, 20, for the 21st century. So thank you and looking forward to working with you uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Yamini. Uh, now I would like to introduce our speaker for the inaugural event of this forum, Professor Land Pritchett. Land Pritchett is a development economist from US. After getting his PhD in economics from MIT, Land worked at the World Bank for almost two decades, during which he spent a lot of time in India and Indonesia. He then taught at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where he was the faculty chair for MPA International Development Program. He is currently the research director at uh, RICE, Research on Improving Systems of Education program at Oxford University. He has worked and researched extensively in the fields of economic growth, state capability, education, and labor mobility. He also co-authored the problem-driven iterative adaptation approach, the PDII, which is uh, uh, known a lot to, in, in fact, in Meghalaya, especially to the deputy commissioners and the district collectors, which we have used in different sectors, including COVID pandemic management. So now I request Land Pichet to you know, present. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I feel very honored to be the first speaker in this uh, State Capability Forum and hope this kicks off a long and productive set of discussions that can create uh, a consensus about the directions that uh, the state can move in order to enhance capability. In the introduction, you said I'm from uh, the United States, but uh, the bio points out I'm from Idaho, which is a very small and remote state uh, of the United States. So um, some affinity for small and remote states uh, as opposed to the big uh, centers that are often easier to work in. Um, so I'd like to... I'm going to share my screen, and I'd, as a, I guess, typical academic, I'd like to keep it to just maybe 20 minutes to provide a kind of overarching overview to some issues around state capability that I think will be important for discussions uh, as you move forward. So I'm going to share my screen. So I want to talk about state capability, and I want to talk about some do's and some don'ts and some do's and do nots of donuts. Uh, and I hope if we were in the post-COVID era, I would come in person and bring some donuts just to add some uh, concreteness to the metaphor and some sweetness to the presentation. Um, unfortunately, the donuts are only metaphorical at this stage. So I want to really just lay out three kind of big issues. The first is the do, a do not, and then what are donuts and how do we think about the do's and do nots of donuts? So. The first do is we really should pay attention to state capability as it's central to achieving higher levels of human well-being. And oftentimes I want to contrast what I'm saying with what I call the received wisdom. And I think part of the received wisdom has paid way too much attention to what should be done or which policy should be adopted or how a policy should be designed and way too little attention to the underlying capability to implement and so my first argument, and it, uh, I'm an argumentative uh, guy, if not an argumentative Indian, uh, I, my first point is that we should pay more attention to the capability of what we can do and a little less, less attention to imagining that we can begin on program design on the assumption we can do whatever we want and implement it effectively because that leads us uh, often to to, to uh, mistakes, which leads to the do not. 
The do not is do not seek to adopt best practice as best practice often isn't just a neutral thing, but it actually destroys state capability. And I want to talk a little bit about how the seemingly innocuous and ambitious thing of adopting best practice can actually undermine the path to state capability rather than reinforce it. And then I want to talk about donuts. And what I mean by a donut is a state organization that has lost its core. So as we know, a donut is something with a hole in the middle. And I often worry that the real challenge facing the building of state capability is that the existing organizations have become donuts. They've actually lost their core of a purpose and a set of technical practices that achieve those purpose. And in an organization without a core uh, really fundamentally can't uh, do things. And the first do not of donuts is you can't fix a donut organization by outside in reform. Uh, you can't fix it by beating it from the outside. You can't fix it by, you know, greater accountability. You have to fix a donut from the inside out. You have to recreate the purpose. You have to reestablish a purpose. Um, and then second, I, what I do about donuts is a PDIA approach. A PDIA approach is a way of starting with an organization that may have wandered into being a shell organization and lost purpose. And by rebuilding a core purpose around a priority problem that's within reach of the organization, you can kind of reinitiate or reboot the organization towards capability. So let me uh, first talk about do focus on building state capability. And by state capability, I mean organizational capability of the organizations in the state is the ability for the agents, the frontline agents up and down and those up and down the chain of the organization to take the actions that promote the objectives. Unless your organization has the capability to induce teachers to show up and teach effectively, induce nurses to show up and respond to patients effectively, induce the police to respond appropriately to um, disorder and crime, without that underlying capability, it kind of doesn't matter what policies you adopt. And moreover, um, whereas a, a huge amount of the development focus has been on policies, should we adopt this policy or that policy or this program design or that program design, when you look in the big picture, what matters for human well-being is level of income, which matters in a whole variety of ways, both through private efforts and through creating a tax base on which governments can do stuff, and state capability, and almost nothing else. So it, it may well not really matter that much <laughs> what policies one are formally adopted or legally adopted. If you don't have capability, it, it just doesn't matter. So a lot of times the program design question is the question of whether I should wear a red t-shirt or a green t-shirt in running a four minute mile. Well, I'm old and fat. I can't run a four minute mile. I can't run a 10 minute mile. So too much debate about what t-shirt I wear as I run is really kind of not to the point. The point is if I need to run, I need to work on the running capability, not the program design. Um, so let me just show this graph, which is something I'm working on and it, you know, it takes an index of well-being that have been created that are the basics, nutrition, basic health care, basic education, um, access to electricity, water and sanitation. So I think an index of how well are the populations of these various countries around the world met in their ability to achieve the basics. And then I look at the relationship statistically between GDP per capita and state capability. And what I find is that both of those things matter a lot. Um, and in such that, you know, if, if we imagine increasing capability on this index that runs from a one to a hundred by 25 points, which is roughly kind of a standard deviation of the distribution across countries, that would actually increase this index of well-being by about eight points. To increase well-being by about eight points through economic growth would take 17 years of economic growth at 3% per capita. So economic growth is a powerful underlying causal factor that tends to raise the level of well-being. But at any given level of well-being, well-being also gets 
it is also better when state capability was improved. So the path to human well-being and prosperity runs both through creating a productive economy, uh, which provides a basis for private incomes and for a tax revenue base that provides the government the needed resources it needs to carry out core functions, but it also runs through having independently of that and on top of that, having capability. And kind of more so, I think, again, we want to get the causal chain right. One thing capable states do is they adopt an effective programs, but not vice versa. You can't just adopt an effective program independently of having the capability to implement it. So I just give one example because it's kind of fun and kind of instructive, which is <clears throat> around the world, all countries have exactly the same policy about some things. And yet the range of performance ranges the entire possible range. So for instance, this is a study of delivering the mail. All countries are signatories to a convention that specifies how they'll handle misaddressed mail that arrives from another country and says that they'll return it to the send, they'll return misaddressed mail to the sending country within 30 days. So all countries have exactly the same policy. But the range of outcomes of whether they implement that policy ranges from zero to 100%. So if you mail and these um, <clears throat> clever and slightly mischievous researchers mailed misaddressed mail to various countries to see how long it um, takes to come back, and in a quarter of the countries, or the lowest 25 of countries, none of them 10 misaddressed letters ever came back, whereas countries like Finland and Uruguay and Paraguay and uh, uh, Colombia, Czech Republic, all of the letters came back. But this is just a point that there's a huge discrepancy between what countries say they're going to do, what their official de jure legal policies are, and what they actually do. So many countries say exactly the same thing. So every country has formal policies that committed to achieving universal literacy and numeracy, but outcomes of what whether kids learn in primary school basically range from zero to 100. Um, in some countries of the world, very you know, finishing grade six, almost 0% of the kids who finish primary school can read, and in other countries, 100% of the kids can read. So it isn't the policies that determine outcomes, it's the capability that determines outcomes. Same for health, same for corruption. Corruption, as we know, is a problem all around the world. No country has laws to enable or promote corruption, and yet some countries have massive corruption, some countries it exists, but it's mostly a minor nuisance. And all of that is capability to implement what you have, not that different countries have radical, different formal legal policies. So the first do is, and this is, I think, an important thing to say at the initiation of a state capability forum, uh, focusing on state capability is, in fact, a reliable path to higher well-being across basically everything you can think of gets better if you have a more capable state because it can participate in a variety of ways with the society and with the economy to increase well-being. And the converse is, to a large extent, true. If you don't have capability, there's very little you, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what policy you adopt, it doesn't matter in some sense what the, <clears throat> the legal, what the legislature adopts. Um, if you can't do it, you can't do it. And so saying you're going to do it, actually, and this is my second point, um, do not seek to adopt best practice. Saying you're going to do things that you can't do actually hurts. Um, so I want to sort of give an analogy of, the, uh, uh, of an army. And when you think of the capability of an army, there's two kinds of elements. One is what the army can look like on the parade ground or what they can do um, when they're not under pressure, how you know many times they can fire the cannon per minute or how fast the planes or how accurately they can shoot when they're not under stress. But the whole point of an army is that when you need it, it's going to be under stress. Some opposing army is going to be fighting against them. And you want to think about how does the capability of the army deteriorate when it's under more pressure? So there's the robustness of the capability. And basically, if you throw a low capability army against a high capability army, the low capability army just collapses. It loses its organizational integrity and hence its capability to perform falls to zero. Um, so 
there's often a sharply linear dynamic of organizations. So, you know, throwing your army against uh, a force that is superior to it can turn your army into basically a disorganized mob, um, in which case you've destroyed what capability you had by asking it to do too much too soon. So um, there's kind of out there, there's two completely different views of how one improves the capability of the state to adopt effective practices. One is this kind of notion that you big jump in policy. We adopt this ambitious policy, and then somehow the pull of this ambitious policy will improve practices towards the policy. The other view is that the way you improve practice is by improving practice. And you take the hard slog of improving within the organization the practices, and ultimately good policies reflect good practices. And these are two entirely, you can see, different causal notions. And the risk of best practice is that if the best practice is far from the current achievable practice, you're going to force your organizations into administrative fiction. And once you force your organizations into administrative fiction, it becomes even harder to undertake the hard slog reform that actually improved practice. Um, I, there's a number of examples of that, but um, but I, I, meaning one of the <laughs> one of the things organizations do is they have to decide what the facts are. Um, a policy is, you know, you should do this if this is the fact. You know, if I'm a tax collector and I'm collecting property taxes, this is the value of the property, and if this is the value of the property, and that's the administrative fact, then I collect this much tax revenue. The difficulty is, is the facts are actually pretty flexible. And if I put too much pressure, um, I've got pressures on the organization to be accurate in the facts, but I've got pressures to create fictions. I've got pressures to under-declare the property value. I've got pressures to declare that I was in fact present when I wasn't. I have pressures to declare things that aren't true as the administrative fact. And what that, what that happens is then you create a common fiction about what's actually going on. So a study that's part of this larger RISE project that I was just doing actually measured, um, they, they redid the official test of mathematics in Madhya Pradesh uh, under their own controlled conditions that sort of guaranteed accuracy. And what they found was, is that if you look at the official results, um, the official results are about twice uh, as optimistic of what students can do in school as the true re as the true results. So basically, the officially reported test scores, even in a low stakes environment, even on a test that in Madhya Pradesh is just is not really meant to be high stakes for teachers, not meant to be high stakes for schools, even on a low stakes uh, assessment, just massive undermining of the facts. So if you believe the facts, you would believe that uh, on average, um, the, the uh, proportion correct uh, on mathematics in the schools was, you know, kind of those blue dots or the official was between 60 and 80 percent. Kids are able to answer about 60 to 80 percent of the questions correctly. The reality is they can answer 20 to 40 percent of the questions correctly. Now, if you start off making policy on the presumption that 60 to 80% of the kids are getting the test correctly, what do we do now? You're gonna get completely misguided as to what you actually should be doing when the actual facts are that 20 to 40% of the, of the questions are answered correctly by kids. Um, and so I just wanna give this example of a randomized controlled trial of the popular type that was done um, in Rajasthan some years back. Um, but and it mainly illustrates the point of the danger of kind of adopting best practice. So the uh, a Rajasthan-based NGO, Sewa Mandir, together with some brilliant Nobel Prize-winning academics, designed a way to improve the attendance of auxiliary nurse midwives at the health sub-centers um, because they had noted the blue line 
that only about 45% in the baseline survey, only about 45% of the nurses were present at their duty station when they should have been. So they designed this wonderful policy that was gonna have performance pay for nurses. They would only get paid their full salary if they were present at least half the time. They had NGO involvement in ground truthing. They improved the kind of time recording system so that it was you know, machine-based and not paper-based. They did everything you would have think of to do because of course they were geniuses. Um, what happened was <clears throat> that the recorded absence, according to the official administrative records, went way down. So absent um, or on casual leave fell from 25% to only 9%. So on one level, this program is a big success. Uh, what actually happened was that the fraction of nurses that were physically present in the clinic, such that if you showed up needing something, someone would be there to help you, that went way down too. So that fell from 45% to 30%. So the actual presence at clinics got much worse. <laughs> and you might think, well, wait a second, either they're present or the absent, but I'm sure no one who worked with the Indian bureaucracy would believe that it was so easy as you're either present or you're absent. There was a third category called exempt from duty. What happened is when you put pressure on the system, people just reallocated casual leave or just not showing up for being exempted from duty so it didn't count against them towards the performance pay. So the fraction of time of nurses that was exempt from needing to be present at the duty station went from a little more than 10% to over 50%. So by putting pressure on the system um, to improve attendance, you made attendance much worse. And worse than that, you created this enormous fiction because now the administrative records show that absence isn't a problem. Absence is only 9%. Why would we worry about absence? So um, that's the second main point I want to make is all your efforts to, I, I think the way to build state capability is start from the capability you have and build up, build towards greater capability rather than imagine you're going to start from a sort of overarching policy and, um, and you know, some wonderful practice, some wonderful program design. And then, in your, and then be able to implement that because the failed attempt to implement best practice makes things worse. Uh, not just, it's not just that they fail and it's the same, you can actually make things worse. So let me talk briefly about the do's and do nots of donuts. I, I wanna stick to roughly 20 minutes. Um, uh, effective organizations are effective in my view from a core out. And the core of an effective organization is an overriding and reasonably shared purpose. People in an effective organization know what the organizations are about and share in the vision of that effective organization. And then they share a vision of what the technical practices that lead to the accomplishment of that purpose are. And that is the core of a religious organization. It's the core of a state organization. It's the core of a private sector organization. It's the core of a successful university. It's just a characteristic, I think, of successful organizations. And then around the core, you build a whole array of support functions. You build procurement. The organization needs to buy stuff, so it needs procurement. You build some human resources policies. The organization needs to hire people. It needs a human resources department. It needs some accounting. So you hire some accounting and some financial practices of how money will be, you know, of uh, accounting. You need some IT you need some data that tracks what the organization's doing. You need a legal team to prevent the organization from getting in trouble. But all of these are peripheral functions around the core. Now, organizations can lose their technical core and become donuts. One is that you lose a sense of purpose um, for a variety of reasons. Co conflict among various shareholders of what the true purpose is can lead the organization to lose a sense of purpose. Or you can lose commitment to a set of effective practices. You can, the world can change in such a way that what you were doing is no longer effective, or you can change in a way, or you maybe you were never doing anything that was effective. Now, once an organization <laughs> has lost its core, that core is often filled by a parasite or a virus. Uh, it's filled by something. The organization, particularly if it's a state organization, doesn't just stop existing. It continues to kind of 
survive, but it survives as a shell of itself or as a, or as a zombie. It, it, you know, it continues to survive, but it isn't, and it might, it might actually look like the organization used to look, but it's no longer really a viable organization. Um, now, the do not about donuts is the technical fixes from the outside or the drive of organizations to compliance. So, you know, you can try and drive an outside organization through a data enabled accountability or through, you know, we're going to get tough on procurement. But um, I think my first kind of pithy metaphor uh, is you, you can't beat a turtle to move. Um, if you're confronting a dysfunctional state organization, you're likely confronting a dysfunctional state organization that has survived in this dysfunctional state for years or decades. And it has survived because it has a pretty hard and robust exterior shell to outside attack. Uh, and what happens if you beat a turtle? The turtle pulls in its arms, its legs, its heads. You beat on it for a while till you get tired, till politics moves on, till the IAS officer gets transferred. And then the organization goes about in exactly the dysfunctional way that it was going about before. So, you know, you can't beat a turtle to move. You, you need the inside of the turtle, the head of the turtle, the legs of the turtle to pull out and head the direction you want it to, to, to head. So, um, so, A, if we're thinking about improving state capability, we have to think of how do we improve state capability from the inside out? Uh, now, the second pithy metaphor is that you don't make Pinocchio from a puppet into a real boy by adding more strings. Um, and I hope this metaphor isn't lost on what exactly I'm talking about, but you know, there's a, there's a tendency to believe that if we just had enough IT, if we just, you know, put a tracking device in every civil servant's arm, we could somehow command and control the, uh, the state into greater effectiveness. And it's just, it doesn't work like that. If you want a real boy, you need from a puppet, you need magic. <laughs> uh, you need something to happen to transform it in such a way that it, it has an internal drive and an internal practice. Uh, so the do of donuts is PDIA and PDIA is already being practiced. I know in some units of Magalaya and other places, but it's local solutions for local problems. You need to start from a problem you need to reorient the organization to a problem-solving mentality where you generate an authorizing environment to work a problem. Then once you have a problem, you need to push problem-driven positive deviance. You need to allow people to do something different than what they're doing in order that they can discover what works. And that requires freeing in, uh, people up to search for solutions to the problem. That search is going to involve try, learning, iterating, and adapting. That is the IA of PDAA. And that means you need feedback loops. You need to say, I'm going to try this. How am I going to know if it's going to work? What are going to be the signals that um, tell me whether or not it's working? And then finally, you're going to scale this through the organization through diffusion. Uh, diffusion means other people adopt these improved practices because they're convinced their improved practices that will make them better off. That's how you're going to scale learning. It's not going to be scaled in a top-down way. Um, although the top can facilitate the scaling, it still has to diffuse. So let me just, I'm going to stop there. And I know people will have questions and we have time for discussion. So the first, let me just reiterate. First, the focus on state capability is central. The focus on policy and program design, I think, is entirely secondary to, you know, it, it's fun to do, it's, it's easy to do, but it's entirely secondary to, you know, what is it that these organizations can actually do that will actually have traction on real world problems that affect the citizens of the state? And that's going to be building capability, not adopting new policies necessarily. And Moreover, the policies that are effective are likely to emerge from effective practices rather than being parachuted in 
And that's the second thing is best practice is, is uh, not only is it not best practice, it's not even good practice, probably bad practice to adopt best practice. The achievable practices should be the goal and the goal of capability efforts is to expand the range of achievable and effective practices. If that starts out as the goal, you will work your way to uh, the achievable practices. And then finally, we should all admit in discussions of state capability that we are where we are. And that sounds stupid, I know, but you know, we are in the historical trajectory of state capability that we're in, which means many of the organizations we want to work to improve have been managed to maintain their current low capability, their current practices for years, if not decades, at this low level equilibrium trap that they're in. And so we shouldn't expect fixes to be easy or instantaneous. Um, fixing a donut is hard and we're going to waste our time and effort if we're focused on outside in fixes. A donut needs to be fixed by filling the center towards the edges, not fixed from procurement reform or accounting reform or IT enabled data structures creating the core. The core has to reach out to the services, not vice versa. And then finally, the strategies that are going to rebuild a purpose and effectiveness in a donut environment are basically problem-driven approaches. They're going to get the individual agents and authorizers of the organizations excited and motivated by solving a problem and then move towards practices that solve the problem as a way of reinvigorating the core. Let me stop there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor. This is great. I think you gave great insights on do's, do nots, do's and do nots of donuts. I think the example of a donut actually is uh, very, very important for us. So, in fact, uh, before I request uh, the participant, especially a lot of uh, colleagues are there from, you know, uh, from the, those who are working with the Meghalaya and, uh, and also the deputy commissioners who are the district magistrates, uh, they're also here. And before actually I uh, open the forum, uh, I would like to start with, you know, begin with a question on education because you have uh, done a lot of research on education. You also wrote uh, about schooling is not learning, you know. So can you tell us a bit about what you mean when you say that, that schooling is not learning and how can this education story inform how we think about state capability? I think the education story is in many ways illustrative and even paradigmatic of the challenge of state capability, which is when countries post-independence began to expand their education system, in some sense, the purpose was very clear. The purpose was to equip children for their adult lives, to equip them with the skills they needed, literacy, numeracy, knowledge, critical skills, etc., in order to, you know, be effective citizens, effective workers, effective members of the community, effective parents, all the things you need to do as an adult. Over time, that involved both getting every kid in school and making sure the kids in school learn. The difficulty is one of those tasks was really amenable to the logistic kinds of ways in which governments like to operate, hierarchical process compliance. So you can build schools in a process compliance way. So what not just India, many countries around the world did, is they were quite amazingly successful at expanding the, the, the enrollments of children in school. The problem is, is that that modality of running an organization often eroded the core commitment to the actual purpose of education. So you had a lot of education systems that more and more were just going through the motions of schooling without actually producing real effective learning environments inside the schools. And so you got uh, what a recent RISE paper has called an anti-work culture, where the people, given that there wasn't a clear and driving purpose and that they didn't see that, that clear and driving purpose of educating children as actually being rewarded or promoted by the system, you got an environment of cynicism, you got an environment of absenteeism, you got an environment of indifference to actual learning. And so you ended up with schooling and not learning. 
And again, I'm not talking specifically about India. This is a generic phenomenon in many countries around the world. And so essentially what you now have are, are semi-zombie education systems. The education system isn't, in fact, an integrated system committed to a set of effective practices to promote learning and a shared understanding of the learning that's being promoted. So now you, you need to reinvigorate the purpose of learning. If you don't start from a reinvigoration of the purpose of learning, none of the education reforms um, that are piecemeal or outside driven can really make a difference. And, you know, I think we I was in living in India um, when, you know, the SSA program was, you know, being implemented at scale and it, it just never really readdressed the core problem. And hence you had massive expansions of expenditure, massive improvements in what I call the thin inputs, you know, more schools had a boundary wall, more schools had toilets for boys and girls and all of those things were nice, but the underlying core never got touched. And hence um, we just haven't yet seen um, significant improvements in learning. Um, so I think this illustrates exactly the tension between kind of a process compliance mode in which state organizations can survive and a purpose-driven mode um, in which state organizations can thrive and expand their capability. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I will uh, just like uh, before requesting my colleague, Dr. Vijay, I just one question again to everyone. Often people think that state capability means training. You know, is training the same as the state capability building? We would like to get your um, insights on this. <laughs> um, the answer is no. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 the answer is not no. The answer is no, 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 no. It's really no. Um, and let me, <laughs> let me start from a slightly cynical um, statement that a friend of mine who's one of my development heroes makes, which is there's the old saying, if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for one day. The corollary is if you set up a training program to teach a man to, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for one day. But if you set up a training program to teach a man to fish, you can give your brother-in-law the contract. Training is on the assumption that the core limiting factor of the organization's capability are individual capacities that can be transmitted through training. So often training focuses on the capacity of the individual, not the capability of the organization. And what we can see is in dysfunctional organizations, um, or individuals aren't getting to anywhere near their actual already existing capacities. There's a really excellent study done by Jishnu Das and Kartik Marladaran about healthcare practices in India, and I think it is in rural Madhya Pradesh that they did the study. Um, and they basically looked at what public sector MBBS doctors did in their public sector practices, and they measured their theoretical knowledge, and then they measured what those exact same doctors did in their private sector practices. And what they found is, in their public sector practices, the, the doctors were just doing incredibly less of, than what they knew to do and what they in fact did when they were in their private practices. So in that context, training, okay, we can train the MBBS doctors to have more medical knowledge, but their capacity as doctors was never, ever, ever the issue for the capability of the healthcare they were providing. So in our work, we make a big difference between an organization and its capabilities, which is what can it induce the agents to do in practice, and the capacities of individuals. So just around the world, just billions and billions and billions of dollars is spent on training. But if that training is individual capacity focused in a way that isn't focused on what are the actual binding constraints, what's holding an organization back from being more capable at achieving its purposes, if the training isn't geared towards building organizational capability, it's a complete and total waste of time and money. So there is training that can work. 
but the training has to be focused on a problem-driven, purpose-driven building of organizational capability, not a technically driven building of individual capacities. I mean, property, just take tax collection, right? The problem isn't valuing property. Property tax is not under collected because the capacity to value property <laughs> is uh, somehow in short supply. It, it, it's something they could do. Um, they just don't. And so you'd have to say, why are we organized such that they're not, um, uh, they're not exercising even the capabilities they have? So I think I, 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 I'm, you know, training can work and it mostly doesn't. And it mostly doesn't because it's based on a wrong theory of what the limitations are to organizational capability. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to request our uh, Chief Secretary, uh, ma'am, would like to make some, obje- uh, yeah, some questions. Uh, it's not an observation, it's just a question. You know, we in government are great at enunciating policies, but our Achilles heel is, you know, uh, implementation, delivery. Yeah. So what's happening right now is a top-down approach. Okay, we may, you know, put up a policy in the public domain and ask the suggestions from, from the public, but most often than not, we, we, we tend to even ignore those suggestions. So a better thing would have been a bottoms up approach, but knowing the capability or rather incapability of our local functionaries, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we come up with a bottoms up uh, approach for you know, uh, a policy? I think the answer is a bottom-up approach needs to be selective in the sense that, you know, nobody, nobody imagines that, or I hope nobody imagines. And we have this kind of slightly dysfunctional top-down approach. And the answer is to just let everything happen. Just let's release all of the top-down constraints and somehow things will get better. That's not what's going to happen, right? Um, so what I think you want to think of is in nearly every organization, um, there's going to be three kinds of people. Um, there's going to be people who are basically willing to free ride on the organization, rent seek on the organization, be corrupt. They're not really either concerned with following the rules or with organizational purpose. Then there's a group that are willing to do kind of whatever they're told to do. Well, these are process compliers. And then in every organization and in every, in, there's going to be some more people who want to do better, who are in the organization for the purpose, who have ideas. And the key to a successful bottom-up approach, and this is an integral part of PDIA, is to, un, is to create an environment in which you can unleash the potential capabilities of those people. So it isn't a, an immediate organization reform in which we immediately devolve all power and decision making to the bottom up. Rather, what it is is how do we unleash within the capabilities within the organization such that we enable them to not to go beyond process compliance to purpose driven problem solving. So we, we enable that, and then what we we hope happens is they start discovering. And we do it, by the way, without enabling them with tons more money or tons more uh, resources, because that is just going to make what they do ir- not replicable elsewhere. But we unleash them to, you know, do new and innovative things. Then, hopefully, with feedback loops, we find that they get more effective at solving problems. Then what we try and do is use those practices to bring the next group along, right? Right. So I'm not saying that every individual purpose person inside these organizations or inside is going to be an innovator, but what we can do is if we can unleash the innovators, then the innovators can drag the compliers to better practices. And then we worry about the non-compliers later. Um, But the opposite, and this is what I characterize as the outside in approach, is that we treat everybody as a process as one of two things. One, we treat everybody as a process complier and we don't provide the innovators with space, right? So so again, this isn't, you know, bottom-up is a tactical and strategic bottom-up, not an immediate agenda in which we just turn loose everybody to do whatever they want. So that that 
we need to recreate a balance in which, again, in which we can create some pressure from the local initiatives and then use that pressure from the local initiatives to, again, to lead the turtle, <laughs> which is the potential process compliers, into better performance. Um, so it's a selective and tactical bottom-up rather than, a, you know, uh, I worry that a lot of the bottom-up uh, I mean, one response I have to make to sort of bottom up is I can see that this is the bottom. I don't, don't see any up. Uh, <laughs> what's your strategy for getting from the bottom that you're in now up? And so I, I, I take PDIA as a strategy for unleashing the, the capabilities that do exist within the organization and the purpose driven individuals in the organization to innovate in, in a way that creates potentially replicable practices that can draw the organization up and draw other localities up. But that's what I mean by diffusion rather than top down. Thank you. This is great. Uh, Vijay. Uh, good evening, Professor. Very quickly, the distinction between the purpose and the process is something that we kind of deal with every day. And as you say, as you said, you know, there's so, uh, I think in, in the organization, there's a big chunk of process compliers and uh, there's, there is very little space uh, for, the, for the people who are purpose driven. So the central question then is how do we create purposeful organizations? To me, I see only two ways. One is, okay, in developed countries, in the, in the, in the Western countries, there is, there is a huge cultural influence in the sense that it is, it is hundreds of years of good practices in the society which have built up to kind of create those organizations. That's one. Second is leadership. Is there, is there, of course, I'm sure, you know, in the PDIA, there are, uh, you know, ways of how to do this. But when I think about these two things, and neither of these two is in the control of, uh, you know, they're both random in the sense that, okay, culture, whether you have this cultural thing or not, leaders is, okay, you get these good leaders or not, because this is not. So how do you systematically create purpose driven, especially in government? Because the, 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 the tension in government, why people are process driven is because, especially if you think from a, uh, from a spending money point of view, uh, you know, people are spending public money and there are hundreds of rules and regulations. And, and so where is that fine balance and who is to determine that balance? And that's the reason why, you know, the government missionaries are slow and we measure people on processes because that is easy to measure. I, I think, hey, I think you're exactly right that within the public sector, there's this kind of there's sacred trust of the public wheel, right? We would taken money away from people through taxes and hence we need to be responsible in spending, right? And so one of the things I hear all the time is that, you know, public sector organizations are hard to reform because they're afraid of failure. And I think like many things that are the conventional wisdom, this is exactly wrong. Public sector organizations exist, exist to fail without blame. It's not that they're failing. I mean, after all, the, the education system is not afraid of failing to teach kids to read. They are not teaching kids to read. And yet that, that failure has no traction. Like nobody is afraid of that failure. I remember one time I was working with an Indian colleague of mine, and I was proposing that we have unleashed some bottom-up pressure of some local level village school committees to try new practices around education. And their response was, no, 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 that would be too risky. Uh, uh, allowing you know, people any latitude would be too risky because they might misuse or abuse the money. And this was in a state where 11% of kids could read at a grade two level in grade four. And so I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So you're saying it's too risky what about the risk <laughs> that 90, you know, 89% of kids are not learning to read at grade level? Like that risk you're apparently willing to ignore, uh, you're not afraid of that failure. You're just afraid of blame, right? So one way I think of what needs to happen in order to build <laughs> state capability is we have to move from a set of systems that allow failure without blame to a set of systems that allow success without blame. <laughs> and that might sound paradoxical of allowing success without blame, but 
But that's really a huge risk. Oftentimes, the people who are pushing at the borders of doing things that would actually enable um, success are then highlighted for not, you know, being process compliant, for being sort of not following the rules. And so success actually brings blame, whereas failure at a core purpose doesn't bring blame. So second, now let me get to your two approaches. One is that I'm, I'm, there was a Chinese leader, and I forget who it was, I think it was Deng Xiaoping, who used to say, whenever I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. Um, <laughs> in the sense that culture is often kind of the, big, the, the this vague, amorphous thing that kind of blocks progress, and hence we can't make progress because it's culture. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm an American. I don't know that Americans have a particularly, like, admirable <laughs> culture compared to India. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think what is important is not a generic culture, but an organizational culture. So there is an organizational culture that can inhibit success, but it's not a generic cultural feature that one needs to be, oh, we can't do it. Um, uh, I have found that, you know, I've lived and worked in India off and on for uh, 30 years now, and I think culturally Indians are some of the most innovative and dynamic people I've ever been around. Just the, the spirit of, and I forget what the Indian word of the God, right? Just making it work is an intrinsic part of uh, uh, a lot of Indian culture. So I think Indian culture generically has everything it takes to succeed. The question is, can that culture be brought inside the public sector, right? So, so I think, can you create a, a, a purpose-driven, problem-driven approach inside the culture of public sector organizations, not generically. And secondly, that does take leadership, but it, as part of PBIA, we emphasize that there's one vision of leadership, which is that the leader brings the solution. There's another vision of leadership in which the leader authorizes action and enables action. And we think the second model of leadership is a much more effective way of building from low capability to high capability. Um, in fact, you know, as part of our PDA book and work, one of my, my colleague, Matt Andrews, did a study where we looked at 30 different international developing country cases of success. And in only two of those cases was the success the result of a leader coming in with a solution that they knew in advance would work, implementing that solution as designed and having success. That was two of the 30 success cases. Nearly all the other cases of success were a leader framed a problem in a way that it authorized others to act, enabled them to have what they needed to, you know, pursue problem-driven kind of practices that would lead to solutions, and then created the environment in which those solutions were adopted. And the solution was never anything like what you started, you know, what you would have envisioned as a clean, well-designed solution to start with. So I agree that, lead, so I do think we need a leadership-focused approach and there does need to be powerful leadership and that leadership is going to have to come from the people in this room. But when you in this room think of yourself as leaders, um, you want to think, how am I acting in a leader in a way that conveys a culture of problem-driven and purpose-driven action and enables those at the bottom level to off to act with agency in a way that unleashes their potential and then also produces process compliance so that you don't get um, this eroded by rent seeking or, or malfeasance. So the, that, that, that kind of leadership I think is really important, but the, the imagination of leadership is that I'm the leader and I have a big stick and I'm going to beat the turtle to move towards the goal. That model of leadership is just not going to work. Uh, uh, well, it's not going to work. Thank you, Professor. So we have our uh, uh, district magistrates. So some of them would like to share the challenges and uh, some of the lessons that, you know, uh, they, you know, they have learned while applying this uh, problem-driven iterative adaptation approach. 
So I would request uh, uh, Ramakrishna from South West Garo Hills District. Uh, good evening, Professor Prichet. Uh, in a country like India, where the state is the welfare state and the public depend on most of the basic needs on the government, actually they form uh, a part, they are a part of the state. Instead of looking at state as the governance mechanism only, they are, they also form a part of the state. Right. And there actually we have some difference in the shared purpose uh, because of uh, misinformation of religious beliefs or any other reason. Because now actually everyone wants to end COVID. But the thing is, uh, is vaccination the most effective way? Uh, some of the stakeholders are thinking that it is and some of the stakeholders are thinking that it is not. And it is more of an attitude and something like accumulated beliefs over a period of time. So in such a situation, uh, most of our uh, iterations and adaptations, they did not achieve the results as we expected. Whereas in case of maternal and child health, we were able to see some good results. Whereas when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, in addressing this hesitancy part, even after we roped in religious institutions, NGOs, mm -hmm. and all other stakeholders, uh, especially in the core hesitancy mm -hmm. areas, where actually this social reinforcement works, like all the households believe, share a common belief and they reinforce each other. Yeah. How should the service provider proceed in such a situation? I mean, there's a really deep and important point that goes beyond COVID here, and I, I'm not going to be able to suggest a solution as to how immediately to reduce resistance to this is, uh, again, my country is, uh, has this problem. So this is not uh, unique and it's an unbelievably difficult problem. But let me start from uh, when, I, when I say problem driven, uh, we, we need to be sure that there's an adequate understanding and agreement on what the problem is. Oftentimes, um, <clears throat> the problems that get nominated and the solution are nominated in an internal technocratic process without askingly asking the question, does this really, is this really a problem that's being nominated by the citizens, by the politicians, or, and is there a sufficiently adequately shared vision of the problem? Um, and the difficulty is, is that when the problem gets framed exclusively technocratically, you can run up in implementation against people who aren't convinced of the solution because they weren't actually brought on board early in understanding what the problem was to which the solution was tailored. Um, I, I did this very I, many, a number of years ago, I, I did a, a study of <clears throat> after uh, Iran had kind of cut itself off from the rest of the world as part of the Islamic revolution in 1979. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Iran implemented one of the most successful family planning programs that had ever been implemented in the history of man. They had the most rapid fall in rural fertility of any country ever through a really unbelievably massive and rapid expansion of family planning. Now, you might have thought, geez, like Islam had always been, in many Islamic countries, they've been resistant to Western-driven family planning programs. But when Iran went to do it, they did it with a shared understanding of a problem that Iran faced and a shared understanding of what the social and cultural resistances to the other typically top-down driven ways of doing uh, family planning programs had been and the reason why they have created resistances. So they found a way to, in fact, work with the local religious, religious leaders and work through the local, um, both religious and health leaders, to change completely the vision of what was an Islamically accepted view of family planning. So I'm just giving this example, not that it's directly relevant, but it's just an example that when we say problem driven, we part of the essence is creating the problem in a way that authorizes action. Often we as technocrats believe we know and often we do know technical things about the world. Um, 
but we can't create the problem necessarily, or we need to pay attention to creating the problem in a way that it's widely shared that our vision of the problem is in fact a shared purpose. Um, Because otherwise, you know, you can start down technocratic and managerial and things that are completely, totally technically correct, but get hampered in implementation because you didn't take the time to build the problem. So often, and now COVID is kind of an exception to every rule, and that's why I hate talking about COVID because it's this uh, unbelievably dire and unique thing. But, but, you know, often as we work on PDAA, what we want to do is slow down the problem definition stage because uh, people want to skip. Oh, no, 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 no. We know what the problem is. And often they know what the problem is because they know what they think the solution is and they have defined recursively back to the problem from the solution they have in mind. And by skipping the problem definition phase of creating the shared definition of the problem among all of the relevant shareholders, you then just get stuck immediately in implementation. This isn't, and again, I agree, this isn't completely at all solving your problem. But I, I just want to raise the more generic point that the problem definition stage means getting to a shared understanding of the problem with not just the internal organization shareholders, but with the authorizers and the citizens. And I notice in the state capability approach and that you're using there, you have a kind of vision of citizen state relationship as being a very important part of the overall process of building capability. Thank you, Professor. So now I would like to request our uh, uh, Honorable Minister uh, for Health, uh, Mr. James Sangma is here. He has a question for you. Um, Good afternoon, Professor. Um, Just wanted to say it's a great honor to uh, be here and to get to know you. Um, I just want to say your presentation has been so riveting and eye-opening. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, this uh, lovely presentation. Uh, After listening to you, it just appears that, um, uh, you know, that we as a state and we as a nation, uh, would you say, uh, are already, as you would call it, in the capability trap? And um, <laughs> would you say that? And uh, secondly, I wanted to ask you that, um, do you think it's time for governments uh, and unique states like us, like Meghalaya, to, um, to hyper-localize our growth do- doctrine based not just on, um, on human capital, but also on natural capital? I mean, two parts of the question. One, um, I definitely think uh, significant parts of India are in a capability trap. But by the same token, one of the points I, you know, I always make is that parts of India work really amazingly well. Uh, and India has had a lot to be proud of. Uh, over the last 30 years. It's a night and day different place than what I came to in 1991. So again, I I don't think pessimism, you know, parts of India are in capability traps, but I wouldn't let that lead to pessimism that the trap is inescapable. Um, You know, India holds the world, is the world's largest democracy and holds free and fair elections uh, uh, at just a, a scale most other countries can only imagine. Um, India, you know, can send a rocket ship to Mars successfully. So there are certainly Indian pockets of success that have escaped the capability trap. The question is just how to change that trap dynamic to a progress dynamic. And I think it's it's possible. And then B, uh, I think part of this is going to be, yes, a much more hyper-localized approach. I think... Um, the center-driven, scheme-driven approach is a remarkably successful approach to a very narrow and limited set of problems. <laughs> uh, and fortunately, many of the problems that can be adequately addressed by the scheme-driven approach have been addressed. Nearly every Indian child now goes to school, and that's a terrific accomplishment. So, yes, I am... I've always been a big fan of uh, what you call a hyper-local, which is let's unleash, you know, state-specific dynamics. Let's unleash local dynamics within the states by, again, as the very first question started from, a strategic and tactical bottom-up approach of 
asking ourselves, how do we unleash our specific local capabilities and how are we going to escape as a, as a state or as, you know, districts or as blocks or as villages, how are we going to unleash our own capabilities and build our own capabilities to establish locally accepted and locally implementable practices that are going to achieve and work us towards more capability. Um, so, yeah, I, I think part of the tension is, um, you know, one of the hardest things for any organization to do is to make a transition away from a previously successful strategy. So if you have a successful strategy at expansion uh, and you need to move from you need to move from expansion to quality, that's very difficult because the people in the organization are built around the previous practices. So only in some sense, you can't top down that necessary change. It has to be kind of uh, emerge from a local approach. So I'm super supportive of unleashing the potential capability that exists uh, in localities, in states, in, you know, the incipient leadership uh, to move beyond the kind of trap dynamics in which the fear of the fear of blame rather than the fear of failure is driving process compliance that keeps it at a low level, but from getting to a higher level. Uh, Professor, thank you very much. So what uh, we will, if uh, there are many people who are requesting for some questions, we will pose those questions later. But before that, before actually our Honorable Chief Minister would actually give his final remarks, we would like to show you what the Meghalaya, you know, state, you know, as a whole is trying to do and, you know, what has been done. So we'll show you a few slides. So that would be helpful for everybody. So I think we will show the presentation. This is the kind of a, like a way forward, like, you know, as I mentioned, I began in the initial remarks. So what is the way forward for the Meghala state capability, like based on our own experimentations? So we have been developing this state capability enhancement project as we attempt to apply the principles of state capability for development challenges in Meghalaya. And uh, when we just like some of the, you know, when we started working, when we started investing in the decentralized leadership, local leadership, you know, you know, uh, mobilizing these block level officials, village leadership, you know, we can see the kind of, a, you know, a massive, you know, uh, uh, in fact, results in terms of, you know, uptake of the rural employment, you know, in terms of the spending uh, in the rural development sector, you can see there. And uh, next. So, Again, this led to, you know, a different kind of a things like people coming together and doing like, you know, innovating, you know, mobilizing. Uh, we can see that uh, similarly, you know, we've uh, worked on the health sector, the same kind of a, using the PDI approach involving different, uh, uh, you know, departments together. So again, we could see when we worked on the system, you know, uh, you know, basically, basically systemically, we, and when we started working with a collaborative approach, we could see the kind of a results that we have achieved. And this is again a, a very interesting a case, you know, when we have this uh, nutrition is a major issue. When we started again uh, working with a political leadership, you know, draw the attention. There is a, there is an authorization that like, you know, this needs to be actually addressed. You know, there is an administrative leadership. So that all led to, you can see the kind of, a, you know, the recovery of this uh, severely acute malnourished children and also the moderately acute malnourished children in one year, you could actually come from like almost like over, you know, 20,000 to now today it's about 1100. So this is again, now current work is that like we are working again with the same approach, like again, collaborating with the different departments, you know, the maternal deaths, because this is again an issue, a systemic issue. You know, we cannot look at like as a health problem. This has a, this a gender problem. It's a poverty problem. So it's again working, you know, with that systems approach and using again a technology we also in the process, we also actually started using, you know, a, a technology kind of a, you know, that led to again, a, a, we, we could see some initial results, you know, gains of this intervention. Next. So based on this, in fact, these are the, you know, the six pillars that we found based on our experimentation within state of Meghalaya. We found these six, you know, principles are, you know, pillars are very important to build the state capability or, you know, to see that change that we wanted to see, building that local leadership, you know, essentially, and also making sure that like, you know, we are promoting that citizen state relationship, 
you know through that actually we handled the covid you know involving the communities you know how actually we could you know address some of the important adaptive challenges effective use of data and focusing on the accountability as well as promoting the agency and also really empowering the field functionaries to really experiment and you know find solutions and using we are using a capability through practice approach not through the training alone so how actually people do experiment learn and iterate and you know uh, you know institutionalize that process and we also actually working on the systems thinking in fact uh, one example is that like you know when we talk about you know the education the the learning abilities that what we talk about generally we talk about like teachers training but we are also thinking that maybe we can do even better can we think about the early childhood development period before they come to the school how actually we can address that one so though there is no so that this is the kind of a things that we are thinking next so now the the question is like how do we expand and institutionalize the state capability model to tackle other complex development challenges of the state here actually we have come out with some kind of a of course these are the things that like you know uh, we require a, a great political leadership strong political leadership administrative capability and again is you know that uh, you know we also have to that will actually result into a greater human and economic development so uh, taking this the importance of the political leadership and importance of the administrative uh, you know uh, capabilities how do we you know uh, you know the state leadership can identify and prioritize the areas for meghalaya and define shared vision and goals so we'll go to uh, the this one actually i would like to show this is here actually the authorization you know uh, as you said you know the authorization is important for finding solutions and finding and building the leadership and then thereafter assembling teams and engage stakeholders and using this problem driven iterative adaptation process and, and through that you know we are learning and you know these successes and you know, are actually becoming institutionalized next so that's that's where i would like to stop here these are the kind of a priority areas for the state capability just like many, there are many but like we just like we flagged few things but before i handing over you know to the uh, to the our honorable chief minister who is the authorizer in this entire you know state capability initiative so i would like to request our honorable chief minister to give his remarks and uh, share his vision for the state capability thank you very good evening to everyone uh my colleague in the cabinet james sangma handling our health and uh, forest portfolio among others uh professor uh who has joined us um, professor land who has uh, joined us uh from oxford. from oxford and uh, all our other officials who are here right now uh connected uh, online as well as physically and our officials from cpr who are very much responsible for making this happen uh i won't take much time because i think we have heard a lot but uh i cannot uh, um disagree with the professor in almost every point that he has said in fact i agree with almost all the areas that he has mentioned and i'll just touch upon a few points that uh, i strongly believe are are very correct uh, in the presentations that he had given uh, first of all when in 2018 when we took over the government i was asked a question by the press and by the people what is your top priority and i told them my top priority is to improve the delivery mechanism because we have a lot of money that comes in we have a large number of schemes that come in but somehow it does not reach the people on time and somehow the implementation of these schemes also are not done to the level where it needs to be done so therefore my one line answer at that point and i still stick to that answer of mine is that we need to improve the delivery mechanism at the grassroots level now having said that i believe there is no real uh, perfect solution when it comes to running a government because it's not like a corporation or not like a business house where rules can be followed there is politics there is social uh, you know a character there is public issues and you need to balance out all of it so really at the end of the day uh, it's really balancing things is what's important uh, so you need to keep an agenda in mind you need to ensure that uh, these are the areas that you're focusing on you have health sector you have infrastructure the social sectors the economic sectors uh but while you do all of this 
you are in the middle of this entire ecosystem with just unpredictable things happening. And somehow we have to manage and juggle all of it together. And that's really what the challenge is. But without getting into those aspects, I would like to, um, again, as I said, touch on one or two points that are mentioned uh, earlier by Professor. Number one is that I have always been a very firm believer of uh, purpose-driven and a problem-driven uh, process, you know, uh, process to move forward. Simply because uh, if there is no purpose, then the passion and the motivation does not come, whether it's in the leadership or whether it's in the officials. And I think leadership's quality or one of the most important tasks is to instill that sense of purpose among the team members, to give the direction as to what is it that we want to achieve. And obviously in the process, when we try to achieve that, identification of the problems is, is very critical. And I was reading one very successful CEO. Uh, uh, he was one of the CEOs from one of the uh, Indian companies. And he said, and uh, somebody had asked him, what is your leadership uh, mantra? Uh, so he said, it's very simple. I just find good people and I allow them to do whatever they want. So that's really uh, a very, very powerful mantra. I believe in that myself. And uh, because sometimes uh, you know what the problem is, you know where you want to get, but you don't have the time nor the capacity to, at the end of the day, figure out the solution to every problem. And so therefore, for me also, I've been very clear. I would like my team to be able to, number one, be very motivated, to be very clear about the purpose and the vision that we have, to be able to identify our goals in a very systematic manner, time-bound manner, and then allow them to do what they have to do to find the solution to it. All I ask my team, you can ask my team and when you speak to them and when you engage with them later on, I just tell them, I don't know what you will do. I don't know how you will do it. All I know is that I want this particular target to be completed by this particular date. So I, I strongly subscribe to this, uh, um, this uh, definition of leadership, which you've mentioned is that it's not about uh, really coming in with the solution yourself. Really, you, you have limited capacity. Uh, as a leader, you need to look at uh, the overall picture, but then you need to empower your team, especially the team members who are motivated. And uh, this is where we have started a lot of things. Uh, for example, when I started off uh, trying to move forward, I was struggling to find people who would be motivated. Seriously, I was struggling to find people who had the sense of purpose. And so I started off with entrepreneurs. So I know that there are entrepreneurs who want to do things and uh, somehow nobody seems to touch them. Nobody seems to, uh, you know, recognize them. Nobody seems to give them any support. And so I realized that entrepreneurs may be one of the most motivated, most dynamic, most purpose driven individuals. So we started with entrepreneurs. We started recognizing them. We started coming up with specific programs where we started having business plan competitions. And it's not just about the fact that you will actually see the economy being impacted in terms of job opportunities coming up and other economic uh, benefits you get, but you will actually see a sense or, and I'll have to use the word culture, but this culture of motivation, culture of purpose coming in. And entrepreneurs can really, really be, uh, you know, very strong uh, idols for uh, so many uh, individuals and uh, so therefore, we started off with, uh, with, with them. And even today, uh, I would say Meghalaya has one of the you know, better entrepreneurial programs. And we still are focusing on, on the entrepreneurs uh, of our state because we feel that uh, they could be shining examples of individuals who are highly motivated, purpose-driven, risk takers, uh, you know, individuals who will fight even in the most difficult situations. And that's the kind of capacity and culture that we would like to have in our system. But Professor, I, I would like to not say I disagree because I don't uh, like to disagree, but I would like to say that um, after my little experience I've had in uh, administration, uh, I want to stress that there is, there is no right way to do things uh, in, the, in the long run. There are different factors that are there, different uh, um, you know, ways of doing things. So, having a purpose and capacity building obviously is overarching aspect of uh, overall governance. But at times we need to learn from, other, from others. So I will not simply say that uh, best practices are not good things or we should not, but uh, I would just say that we need to adapt it to our needs. 
So therefore, uh, there is a good practice. Let's see what is the best part of it. Take it. What is not useful to us, leave it behind. So we, we need to have best practices, adaptive best, best practices need to be brought in. We need to have processes. A government system is so complicated. You know, if you don't have process and you leave it to individual, uh, there will be chaos. So we need standard operating procedures in the system. We need processes. <laughs> we need continuous monitoring that has to be there. But why we do all of this, obviously, the overarching aspect is that the team needs to be more. And um, I have been talking about this a lot to my team now. It's another uh, theory or whatever you call it that has come into my mind that has been really playing around in my mind is that we have a lot of departments doing a lot of things. And, uh, you know, and sometimes uh, the purpose is the same. You know, but everybody is doing different programs, different schemes, spending double, triple money. So I have come with this, uh, you know, uh, point when I'm, you know, and again, just trying to analyze the whole, uh, whole thing. So I was, in fact, in the morning, I was talking about it, that it's, it's like creating noise. So what happens is that if one department does something, it's like, you know, one noise is created. Then a second department does something, again, a noise is created. Third department does something, another noise is created. So when you listen to all of these things, it's like a large hodgepodge noise going on. But if you're actually able to synchronize the work that they're doing, if you're able to synchronize the noises that are being made, this noise is then converted into music. So how can we convert noise into music is another point that I strongly feel, you know, we need to focus on when we do for go for this capability building. Now, when so much is happening, somebody needs to coordinate it, put the efforts together, as I said, create music out of the noise that is there. And a lot of noise is there. A lot of things are happening. It's just a question of rearranging things, you know, connecting one dot to another dot, uh, connecting one program to another program. And uh, that's another part because what happens is when you're able to do that, you will be able to get more out of, uh, you know, the efforts being put in at the end of the day. So this is another aspect which I would want the team to really focus on. I don't want to go into... You know, I was told to talk about the state's vision. I mean, I can go on and on and on about being number one in this, number two in this, trying to get up these numbers. Those are just numbers. At the end of the day, uh, you know, there is a systematic uh, problem in the system, as was uh, mentioned by Professor. We need to look inside where we are, where the problems are. My biggest frustration only is that it's such a big system. And uh, my frustration is that uh, we just don't know how long this process of trying to bring in this capability and this sense of purpose will take. But, uh, but I'm happy to see that the system, the process has started responding. I'm happy to see that it's happening. We're actually seeing uh, things moving. And maybe the biggest advantage we as a state have is that we are actually a number that is manageable. Now, you look at a state like Uttar Pradesh. And I've got 10 plus crore population. It's 100 million people. I mean, even if one wants to start, uh, I don't know where they will start and where they will end. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, be negative about them. But I think the, the, the biggest uh, uh, advantage we have is we have a state that is manageable, that has got a population about 3.8 million, which we can actually make a difference in. More importantly, we have institutional setups and systems that are actually working right now. We have empowered them to a large extent. We're actually seeing uh, the numbers now coming up, like you saw in immunization. We were at the bottom of the chart, Professor. We were at the bottom of the chart three years back. And today we are at the top of the chart. You see? Our numbers and our expenditures in many of the Government of India schemes have tripled in the last year, even during COVID. You know, reflecting that uh, the system is actually responding to the kind of uh, push motivation we're doing. So therefore, um, uh, you know, when I say SOPs are important, processes are important, it is because it is because of the continuous monitoring. My team monitors certain things every week. You know, I, 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 I feel bad for the deputy commissioners because they are every Tuesday they have to come, every Wednesday they are on video conferencing. But then there is, uh, you know, there is clear results. We are actually seeing the difference. So to conclude, uh, I don't think there is any perfect solution or perfect mechanism that one can 
put on the table and say, well, this is the uh, answer. I mean, for academic purpose, we could discuss it. There's no problem. But when it comes to practical, everything will have to be based on the situation you face. Everything will be based on the different dynamics that are you're facing the challenges. And every step you take will depend on what particular uh, issue is more important at the point in time. I mean, it could be they're going to face elections the next year. So obviously, uh, you know, when you're facing elections the next year, then there are certain issues that come to your mind uh, as a policymaker, a decision maker. It's, it's something that's common to all governments, not just me. So uh, it, all of these factors will be there. But yes, uh, when, you, when you look at the overall aspect, the processes, the, pur uh, the purpose, the passion that you talked about, uh, these are very, very crucial. You need to have that core. Otherwise, um, you know, you're not going anywhere, no matter what policy you have, no matter what, uh, you know, uh, schemes you have, none of this is going to make any difference if the sense of purpose is not there. And I have been, uh, you know, speaking about my purpose and I would like to end my, uh, my talk with, uh, or my views with uh, just this one line. I tell people that if somebody asks me, what is my purpose? So my purpose is to be able to make a difference in every individual's life that we touch a positive difference. So that is my purpose. With that purpose, I work. So that purpose helps me to work in even very difficult conditions. I'll just give you an example. The day before yesterday, I was traveling from back from Shillong after finishing a number of political meetings back to my constituency. And I reached at about 11, 12 o'clock in the night. I was very tired. But suddenly I saw this uh, old man uh, he had no shoes. He was wearing a shirt that was so worn out and uh, most probably hadn't had food also. And he was waiting for me. And I, so I just couldn't help myself. So I just went and I spoke to him because I thought that uh, even if I can sit for five minutes with him and uh, listen to what he has to say, you know, I have, well, enough power to be able to make a difference in his life. And uh, if that purpose is not there in my mind, then I think my tiredness would have got over me. And uh, I would have just gone into my room. So it's so important, as you said, that one has to have that sense of purpose because it allows you to push yourself and go beyond uh, even certain limitations, physical, mental, and be able to really do what, uh, what you want to do. So I think uh, I'm very much with you in that, Professor. I managed to make a difference. He wanted a low-cost house. So I, you know, I, I worked with some people. I got the low-cost house uh, you know, worked out for mm -hmm. him. And, um, and we are able to you know, help people, individuals like that. So to conclude, uh, thank you so much. I, I must say the Meghalaya State Capability Forum, I'm sure is going to be something uh, which is going to be really, really great. But um, I must tell you that you also must have a sense of purpose. <laughs> and number two, you must have a time-bound manner in which you're going to do it. Have set goals that you're going to uh, think. And I would be happy to see if you can work out specific programs that you're going to work on. So going generalized way is not going to be able to quantify the kind of results that you will get. If you can come out with a specific area, maybe a specific program, maybe a specific problem that we have and actually work and show on how the capability aspect has made a difference in that particular problem, then I think it will be easier to sell this and uh, motivate others to also uh, be part of this. So therefore, um, uh, um, you know, to conclude, no perfect solution, but uh, uh, we need to mix and match. And in governance, things are always very complicated. But uh, yes, these are areas that uh, can help us resolve a lot of problems. I once again thank uh, the Center for Policy Research. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Land for his time. And I'm sure the other uh, participants are also very keen to ask him many questions. I hope that we'll get another chance to, to be together and uh, discuss uh, more on this, as this is definitely an area of great interest to me. So, Professor, thank you so much for your uh, time and thank you so much for your uh, inputs. And I wish this forum uh, and all of you the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you, our Honorable Chief Minister, for his sharing his uh, valuable you know, reflections and you know, his, uh, his inspiring words. So, any, I think uh, from the CPR side, any questions you would like to ask uh, either uh, Yamini ji or Mikhaila? Well, uh, Lant, uh, we, we, we've discussed many of these issues uh, oftentimes, but I'm going to ask you a question nonetheless, which is, well, two questions actually. One, um, 
What, one of the challenges with purpose uh, is that uh, we often, um, often institutions work towards purpose, uh, but there are limits, but, but the definitions of purpose itself need to be challenged. So how does one build platforms uh, to be able to iterate around purpose itself? Uh, and I think that that's a uh, links to my second question, which is that very often uh, within government, the target becomes the purpose and we look to find ways. So we've talked about process uh, and targets, but, uh, but, but often the best way to achieve the target is to bypass the state itself. Uh, so we do, you know, there, there, there is this big push towards cash transfers uh, in our debates on welfare across the country, across the globe. We talk about it in the, in the form of UBI, but I think it's a slightly different debate here. We emphasize cash because it's a way of getting around all the flaws within the system to meet your target. So if my purpose is that I need to deliver X to a beneficiary, uh, I will just try and bypass the entire process to get there. Um, and and so and, and I limit it to that. Now, how does how, how does bypassing impact uh, these uh, debates around purpose, role, and normative goals and uh, uh, responsibilities of the state? Let me start from kind of maybe a negative view and work back. <laughs> I worry that um, the cash transfer kind of movement has displaced a really legitimate conversation about the purpose and role of the state Uh, in in the sense that there are things that the state needs to do that simply can't be displaced by cash. So, you know, rule of law, uh, a police force, an education system, and moreover, even where one can imagine individuals using their own cash to solve problems, as is in some components, you know, people rely enormously on the private sector healthcare. The regulatory function of the state, I think, is still super important. So I worry that, A, um, the, the state of India cannot just simply say, we can't provide you a, an uncorrupt and, you know, decent police force. We can't provide you with decent education. We can't provide regulations that even create a thriving environment for an efficacious health sector in either the public or private sector. But instead, here's some cash. Um, that, that, that just isn't, uh, I think, that's not the way to development that any other state has ever pursued. Every other state has ultimately dealt with the core questions of state capability. B, I think the cash puts tools in the service of a really narrow logistical objective. And hence, it makes tech look more important. It makes, you know, design look more important than it really is. So you displace a whole bunch of core purpose of functions that require implementation intensity with something that is, in fact, you know, a logistical process. And then you declare success by having reduced the problem to logistics. So I think one of the nice things that's emerged in the coming year is you know, coping with maternal mortality, coping with um, climate change, coping with the other challenges of education raised isn't going to be solved just through cash. So I've got no kind of deep objection to taking poorly performing in-kind transfers and transforming them into more effective cash transfers. All for that. But let's acknowledge that's 2% of the state capability agenda, not 98% of the state capability. And let's keep in mind you know, core purposes of the state that uh, really need to be improved and enhanced. And many of those are going to be implementation uh, intensive and move forward. Um, The second thing is, I I mean, it's a great question of how do you challenge purpose? um, Because um, one of the ways in which, uh, you know, one of the way, one of the ways in which, uh, organizations end up at donuts is they end up too committed to a purpose that becomes irrelevant. Uh, and hence, you know, in the education sector, for instance, uh, there, you know, getting every kid in school was an important purpose. No one should object to that. But the longer they stayed on the exclusive focus on schooling, 
uh, the harder it became to shift to a new and more expansive vision of you know every child in school and learning. Uh, and so this way of challenging purpose is really important, and I just don't have a good answer to it um, because you know to some extent if you narrow the conversation around just the organization, you can get into an echo chamber around purpose that you know does, isn't open to what the rest of society and what the current circumstances are demanding. So, I, but but how to do that? Um, let me just make with respect to that though. I think one interesting point that I think Devish Kapoor and Pratap Banu Mehta made about capability in India is, and this is came up in the chief minister's remarks, is that there are many organizations doing the same thing. I think one of the things that happens is once an organization becomes a donut, rather than try and fix it, you just create a new organization that actually has the same purpose that you were originally attended for the previous organization. And then as uh, Devesh points out, these organizations often go through a life cycle of after creation, they're purpose driven, and then they start to decline, and then you create a new one. So I, I do think if organizations had ways of rechallenging their purpose and re, you know remaking themselves, that would avoid this duplication process. And at some stage, <laughs> you have to reconsolidate the organizations that were all created with the same purpose, and that's going to be a difficult. So I don't really have a good answer to this challenge of purpose question. And to some extent, that is a role that politicians play. Um, you know, inside organizations, there tends to be an insular view. And, you know, dynamic and visionary politicians are often the ones that come along and go, hey, you guys, you're not in touch with what we really need here. And that's this. Thank you, Professor. I think we have uh, Secretary Education would like to ask a question. Uh, yeah. I have one uh, very small question uh, for Professor Lance. Uh, that uh, in your research paper document, the reward of education, you have mentioned schooling is not learning. Now, I would like to get some tips from you. How does one go about building a strong education system? Um, that's hardly a three minute question. Uh, I, I think the answer is. If we really want to talk about that, I'm happy to set up a forum to talk with uh, that. But let me start with, um, I think, I, I think one of the challenges, and, and if I had to start with how I would really rebuilding an effective education system, I would have exactly the kind of conversation that Yamini suggests about what really is the purpose. Because in many ways, the education system has always defined itself as a selection system, not an education system. It doesn't start from the premise that the purpose of education is to equip every child. It starts from the premise that the purpose of the education system is to identify those few children who are capable of an education and push those forward. So I think if I were a minister of education and I really wanted to really enhance the effectiveness of the system of education, I would start with the question of purpose and start with the discussion of, have we gone on too long with a selection system that says our purpose is to identify those few children that are capable of achieving high performance and push those forward and devil take the hindermost, the teaching to the front of the class, the assumption that many kids can't learn. I think those are deeply embedded in the kind of ideas inside the in the education system. And until one addresses those questions head on in terms of purpose, I think you're gonna have a hard time because people are acting with conflicted purposes. And Yamini is coming out very soon with a great book <laughs> about how the purpose conflict is at the center of education reform. And I'm putting pressure on her because uh, it's a book that's been coming out uh, and it's great. So I, I think if I were you, I would start with are we really of one mind about what we can achieve? And there is no reason why India can't achieve an environment in which every child learns. But to do so, you have to remake and re-clarify that that is in fact the purpose. The purpose of the system isn't to select the elite. The purpose is to equip everyone. And then at some stage, there's a, some future selection. And I, I would start with that. Um, uh, I'm in charge of this, like, 
five million dollar research project on why Vietnam is so successful. And the answer they keep giving me is because they want it to be. And it might seem dumb and it might seem to have been really expensive to hire a bunch of brainiacs to come up with that answer. But it's important because to the extent that you give yourself technocratic answers, you're wrong. The answer is, do you really want it? Thank you very much. Let me let me quit there. I have to. I'm afraid I have to run. I've been very honored to be at this forum and very informed. It's it's super enthusiastic to me to see the enthusiasm and interest in this topic. And I hope this forum becomes a big success. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. And I also thank our co-host, uh, you know, uh, Yamini Ji from the CPR. And also, I would like to thank our uh, Honorable Minister who stayed back, uh, our Health Minister, Mr. James Sangma, and uh, listening to you. And uh, we are very happy and you know, really, it's uh, something that what you have taught us today, how to really work on building the state capability to really address very important problems, you know, that are need to be addressed, you know, to make a progress. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.